Hello and welcome to Sinobabble, the Chinese history podcast. This is episode two of the 20th Century China series. In the previous episode, we spoke about the events that took place to bring an end to China's 2000 year long imperial history. In this episode, we'll be talking about the changes in China's intellectual modes of thought and the people who actually helped bring about these changes, as well as the people who helped develop China into a modern 20th century nation. So if the last episode was about events, this episode is about the people behind those events. Before we jump into the details, however, I think this is a good time to try and introduce to you how China saw itself in the world prior to contact with the West. This will give us some context moving forward and help explain why the changes in China's intellectual modes of thoughts throughout the late 19th century were so groundbreaking and so important to China's development in the 20th century. You may know by now that the Chinese for China is Zhongguo, which literally means the central kingdom. So if China is the center then, the rest of the world is literally the Wai Guo or the outer kingdoms. These outer kingdoms are usually known in Chinese history as the periphery and the people who live within them are known as the Yi or barbarians. Essentially, since about the third century AD, China has in its historical records regarded the Chinese civilization to be the most superior and all external civilizations as far southwest as India, as north as Korea, and as east as Japan, to be far inferior to China's own civilization. Most of these states also contributed tributary states or tributary peoples, where they were just nomads and didn't really have a state. In the records of the Grand Historian, written by Sima Qian during the Han Dynasty, this mode of thought was essentially solidified. China was the central kingdom with the superior civilization, whilst all other civilizations either didn't exist or were just lesser. There was no contact with the West at this time. However, even as time moved forward, contact with other advanced tribes, the importing of foreign goods and even religions such as Buddhism, and even a brief period of rule by Mongolians, did nothing to change China's perception of itself as being culturally superior to the rest of the world. This change really only came about after China's violent clashes with the West, which we discussed last week. It was only through these more forcible events that China was eventually able to see that her civilization may not be the only or the most advanced around. However, as we saw last week, it wasn't so easy to convince her. In this episode, we'll go into far more detail about how China was eventually convinced that other civilizations may have something to contribute to her own. The changes in China's intellectual currents during this period can be broken down into four main stages. So the first stage can basically be described as getting over the idea of China as the Middle Kingdom. This lasted from about the 1830s to the 1870s and covered events that we discussed last week, such as the two Opium Wars and the Taiping Rebellion, and some of the smaller rebellions as well. The second phase I've dubbed the Chinese nationalism and self-strengthening phase, which took place between 1870 and 1890. The third phase constitutes a period of serious attempts at reform during the 1890s. And the final fourth phase looks at the struggles that took place between the conservative, reforming and revolutionary factions that had sprung up in China during this period and how their intellectual battles would shape China's future in the 20th century. So like I said, we're going back to the mid 19th century. If we look at the period just before the Opium War, the 1830s, at this time, foreigners were only allowed to trade through the port in Canton, which was tightly controlled by Chinese officials and the Kohong system, which was an elaborate system set up to control trade, which meant that foreigners could only trade through a very small number of approved companies. At this time, people believed some very strange things about Westerners. For example, they believed that Westerners couldn't survive on land because they'd only ever seen them on their ships and they needed to return to their ships every day or so or they would die. They believed that they needed tea and rhubarb constantly or they would become ill and possibly even die. This was obviously because of the strong demand for these products, but even being a British person myself, I can guarantee you we can survive without tea. Some people also believed that Westerners couldn't bend at the waist because their stiff outfits rarely allowed for it. 
And so no one had ever seen one of them do it. Needless to say, there were a lot of misconceptions around foreigners, as I'm sure there were a lot of misconceptions about the Chinese on the Westerner side. Luckily, at this time, there were a few educated men who were able to see through these more superficial descriptions in order to try and get to the bottom of what the Westerners really wanted and how they could be used to further China's aims. We're already familiar with Lin Zexu, or Commissioner Lin, who was in charge of dealing with the foreigners during the Opium War. Him and a few of his other colleagues, such as Wei Yuan, signalled the emergence of a statecraft school of learning. Those who subscribed to the statecraft school were more focused on China's present matters than the theoretical and metaphysical elements of Confucianism that had been important in preceding centuries. They knew that the West was going to become more of a feature in Chinese political life, and so they began thinking of practical ways to deal with them. They encouraged the learning of foreign languages, as well as the translation of foreign newspapers and important works, particularly those regarding geography, law and politics. Knowledge about world geography also became more important. Lin Zexu himself published a book called the Si Jiu Zhi, or Records of the Four Continents, in order to increase people's knowledge about the surrounding world. His colleague Wei Yuan published the Hai Guo Tu Zhi, or Illustrated Treatise on the Maritime. Their main motive was to understand completely the situation of foreigners, and to understand what advantages the foreign technology could bring them, all with the aim of essentially knowing how to use this technology against the foreigners. This need became particularly urgent after the Opium War. However, aside from the aims of learning how to use foreign technology against foreigners, the increase in knowledge about foreign languages, technology and modes of thought served as the beginning of the gradual dismantling of China as the Middle Kingdom. Though they did try to use several tactics, such as using trade, using the people, and using foreigners to control foreigners, even Lin Zexu himself admitted that Western knowledge may be useful for the development of China. He even went as far as to recommend the addition of a naval section to the Chinese military examination, as well as encouraging the purchase of, the training in the use of, and the making of Western arms. Lin and his cohort can't really be described as reformers as such. They were more acknowledgers of the growing importance of international relations and more sought to use Western technology for the benefit of China as opposed to really understanding the people behind the technology. A second group in this period, however, felt differently. Zhang Guofan, the hero of the Taiping Rebellion, was an early adopter of reformist ideas. He felt it was necessary to utilise Western knowledge to fill in gaps in China's knowledge, whilst also encouraging a return to strict Confucian morality in order to shore up China's collapsing bureaucratic and social spheres. While he believed in the strength of Confucian morality in ruling, he admitted that there was a deficiency in the practical functioning of the state. He trained many of the famous scholars and officials that served the last years of the Qing, including Li Hongzhang, who we spoke about last week and who helped him defeat the Taiping Rebellion, himself becoming one of the most influential scholars of the period. The training of excellent officials was probably Zhang Guofeng's greatest contribution to the last dynasty. He always emphasised the quality of people over their background or even their education, which was very unusual for an imperial scholar of his time. Generally speaking, Zhang was very forward-thinking for a man of his time. He once sent a young acolyte of his, a man called Yingwing, to the United States to procure some of their finest machinery so it could be used in China to manufacture arms and boats. He believed that when dealing with foreigners, one should rely particularly on Confucian principles, faithfulness, trust, sincerity and seriousness. However, he too suffered from a common defect in his thinking, which was shared by most Chinese scholarly officials of the time. He believed that all China needed from the West was its machinery. In terms of politics, morality and civilization, China was far superior. He passed away in 1872, so he didn't get much time to realise his ambitions of furthering China's use of Western technology. But luckily, the next generation that he helped train were willing to carry on his legacy. By the 1860s, China entered a phase that was commonly known as Bian Chu, this essentially means a shift. People were beginning to realise the impact of the Opium War and the fact that China was besieged by foreign powers on both land and sea 
China's sovereignty as well as its colonies were under attack, and its seas were now policed by foreigners, both Western and pseudo-Western. The emperor at the time, Emperor Tongzhi, was just an infant, and so his mother, Empress Dowager Cixi, as well as his father's empress, acted as regents and de facto leaders. Upon the enthronement of Emperor Tongzhi, the Empress Dowager Cixi immediately had a few generals who she believed would stand in her way arrested and executed. However, even though she had begun to get a grip on power, she still wasn't yet the main leader. There were several other actors within the administration that had considerable influence on the political and ideological trends of the time. The enthronement of the Tongji Emperor in the 1860s marked the beginning of a period of restoration, which was to last until the 1870s. The Empress Dowager Cixi entrusted Prince Gong, who you may remember as having to clean up the mess from the Second Opium War on behalf of his brother who had fled to the Summer Palace, as her right-hand man, and for a while he was given free reign while he was in her good graces. Prince Gong had been anti-foreign prior to the Second Opium War. However, after the foreigners didn't actually storm and try and seize Beijing, he realised that they were probably just focused on trade and international relations. He then tried to capitalise on this fact. He set up foreign language schools, which turned into colleges that focused on all the foreign subjects, including maths, science, geography, mechanics and international law. He especially encouraged the study of Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law, which he was able to use to China's advantage on occasion. He also set up something called the Zhongli Yamen, which was essentially an office of international affairs. Although it was never fully made a part of the Chinese official bureaucracy, the Zhongli Yamen became a very important point of contact for foreign powers who wanted to liaise with the Chinese nation. Not everyone was on board with this idea, however. Some scholarly officials even faked sickness to get out of serving in the despicable Zhongli Yamen, only to miraculously recover after they were reassigned to a different department. However, it was still a step in the right direction. Once the revival phase was over at the end of the 1870s, China began to enter a new phase featuring a strong current of westernization. This current would only grow stronger despite conservative backlash until the turning point of the late 1890s. Now we're moving into the second phase, which lasted from the 1870s until the 1890s. This phase is called the self-strengthening movement. However, technically it's actually the second phase of the self-strengthening movement, as the phrase self-strengthening was coined by Zhang Guofan in 1861. However, this was the point in time when real progress was begun to be made, not so much in the physical realm of China, but also in her thoughts and attitudes. One official is of particular note in this period. Li Hongzhan had been growing in power since he helped put out several rebellions in the 1860s and early 1870s, and the imperial court looked on him with great favour, in no small part thanks to his large and very loyal army. He acted as governor general for several different provinces and was at one point granted the highest honour in Chinese officialdom, a three-eyed peacock feather that he wore in his hat. Following his mentor, Zhang Guofeng's footsteps, he went on to spread many of the reform movement's biggest projects and stood out as a sort of figurehead of the self-strengthening movement. He was very entrepreneurial, setting up arsenals, shipping companies, mills, mines, telegraph lines and shipyards. He also oversaw the training of young men abroad in the US and Europe. This is bearing in mind that during the same period he was often called on to deal with local uprisings, large uprisings, international warfare and negotiations with foreign powers. He was a very busy man. He wasn't just working alone however. Some other officials deserve honourable mentions. Zhang Zhidong, a distinguished civil servant and probably the most effective reform-minded governor after Li, set up China's first coal, iron and steel complex and also managed to obtain approval for a rail line from Hankou to Beijing. He was also known for coming up with the Ti Yong formulation, the idea that Chinese learning should remain the essence but Western learning should be used for practical development of China. He thought of this formulation partly to assuage fears over the possible erosion of Chinese values and partly to mark himself out as a more conservative-minded reformer. 
Another prominent advocate of reform and strengthening was Zhuo Zongtang, who constructed the Fuzhou Dockyard. An agricultural enthusiast, he conducted extensive research into improving crop harvests and helped establish cotton and textile industries in northwestern provinces. So as you can see, there were some very hardworking men who were determined to help China reform for the better, using Western ideas but not necessarily replacing China's values. Despite the best efforts of the self-strengtheners, however, the obstacles that stood in their way turned out to be insurmountable. One such obstacle was the pace of reform. A list of major new enterprises for the period 1885 to 1895 shows that only 18 new plants, mines and metal works were founded during the period. China was too large and most of the developments made on the coast never made it to the interior, which continued to suffer from the haphazard weather conditions, frequent natural disasters and turmoil from bandits, corrupt officials and small uprisings. Another major problem was the conservative faction within the government. For brevity's sake, I'll skip the names as they're probably in the majority and thus not that relevant, but I will outline what their major gripes were. The conservatives saw problems particularly with the railways, believe it or not, and also felt that Chinese and Western values were irreconcilable at a fundamental level. It's important to bear in mind that the faction who were staunchly against all things foreign, including learning Western techniques and using their technology, were also the people who used emotional and moral language to encourage warfare with Western powers at any moment they could think of. Their actions precipitated some of the battles, for example, with France and Japan, where they felt that throwing insults as opposed to practically viewing the reality of the situation would be more helpful. They subscribed to a hard-headed Confucianism and the importance of the preservation of Chinese culture, which others had used before them to suggest that the sages would have actually understood the need for change and modernization. They turned the whole self-strengthening movement into an issue of accepting westernization to an extent to save China, or risking the survival of China altogether in order to preserve its long-standing culture and Confucian value system. The conservatives weren't the reformers' only adversaries, however, as they also had battles amongst themselves. In the first instance, as all the reformers were first and foremost government officials, all enterprises were funded by the government and locally established. This meant that politically speaking, the reformers couldn't do anything too drastic and were constantly trying to find ways to make new technology compatible with Chinese values. Secondly, they were personally invested in each project, meaning that instead of establishing armories, shipyards and metalworks that could be emulated across the nation, the self-strengtheners were essentially just private businessmen courting official favour. Zhang Jidong's famed phrase, Chinese learning as the principle, Western learning as the practical, showed that even the staunchest of self-strengtheners believed that strength could be achieved without transforming the underlying essence of Chinese thought systems, thereby missing what it was that made the West strong and what had allowed the Japanese to transform and prosper in such a short amount of time. China refused to update its legal, administrative or banking systems because it believed that the way China governed, in its essence, had no major faults. All it needed to succeed was technology. As we saw in the last episode, however, this just was not the case. Attempts to test out the new system and weapons in China's tributary states against France and Japan backfired big time. China's new disgrace caused a split right down the middle of China's scholarly elite, between those who were determined to keep China entrenched in her conservative ways and those who wanted to reform the whole system from top to bottom. In the end, Li Hongzhang was stripped of his high position after his failure to defeat the Japanese in Korea in 1895, and despite his best efforts at negotiating, which almost claimed his life, he ended up living out the rest of his days touring Europe in exile, his attempts at reform in tatters, but not forgotten. Meanwhile, while this bickering was going on amongst China's scholarly officials, at the very top end of China's imperial power system, huge changes had taken place over the 70s, 80s and early 90s. After the death of the Tongzhi Emperor in 1875, Empress Dowager Cixi had initiated a power struggle that nearly ended in civil war. After squeezing out her few rivals, she managed to gain a tight grip on power, 
turning her attention to those she felt may oppose her. The Guangxu Emperor was enthroned, and with him in place, Prince Gong fell from power in the 1880s after Cixi had been blocking his route to any substantial power because he had had one of her favourite eunuchs executed in 1869. Cixi retired to the Summer Palace after Guangxu came of age, though it soon became apparent that this retirement was in name only. The Guangxu Emperor was interested in foreign affairs. He learnt foreign languages and he hated high spending. However, it's reported that he was also at times petulant and was said to be of weak constitution. In any case, he could do little to check the aggressive foreign expansion that took place after the Sino-Japanese War. Instead, he sought a new beginning for China, a fresh start that would not undo the humiliation of the past, but would build on the lessons learnt from it. In an edict issued in 1895, he said, Allow no slacking, do not pursue empty forms, do not neglect long-term planning, do not blindly follow way, and be realistic in everything in order to bring about real self-strengthening. His genuine interest in reform thus set the stage for a new wave of reformers to enter the scene. Now we're entering the third stage, reforming the system from top to bottom in the 1890s. After the death of the self-strengthening movement and the Sino-Japanese war that ended with the horrifying treaty of Shinmonoseki, the candidates for China's triennial Guangdong provincial exam of 1895 presented a memorial to the throne outlining their fears and their solutions for China's future. I think it's important to note here that we're about to come across some names that you'll probably want to try and retain as they'll be coming up in later episodes about the first years of the Republic of China. So some young examinees from Guangdong had presented a memorial to the throne in 1895. This was highly irregular and could even be considered in some ways rude. The most prominent of these Cantonese scholars was named Kang Yo Wei. He was both typical and atypical for a scholar of his time. He was born into a scholarly official family and started training for the civil service exams from youth. But he also believed that he was a Confucian sage whose mission it was to save China. And as he grew up, he was gradually influenced both by Buddhism and by the Western technology he saw in Hong Kong and Shanghai, which led him to read all the Western translated texts that he could find. He believed that China was in the midst of a crisis of both state and faith, and he was the main architect of the memorial to the throne in 1895 that called for the thorough reform of the country. Another important scholar who was taking the exam and helped issue the memorial was Liang Qichao, who was just 22 at the time of the memorial writing. He was one of Kung's students, and he was actively involved in national societies that had sprung up to encourage reform, though, like Kung, he was also seeking to pass the provincial Jinshi exam, as it remained the only route into officialdom at the time. He was more of a political reformer, however, and believed that democracy was necessary in order to truly bring China into the new age, as opposed to just grafting Western technology onto a dying system. The memorial included the following points of reform. The first was the building of a modern army and navy, which would be overseen by a brand new branch of the government set up specifically to oversee reforms and run solely by reformers. I can only guess who they thought might have been best suited to run such a department. Another reform point suggested the translation of Japanese books on Western technology and culture into Chinese and the refurbishing of the civil service examination to include Western subjects. Some of the things Kang and Liang proposed were directly aimed at counteracting the influx of other Western features of Chinese civilization, including setting up a ministry of religion to oversee a network of Confucian churches in order to fight back against the spread of Christianity. Kang even advocated the changing of the calendar system, abolishing the rain name system in favour of using Confucius's birth date and birthday as year markers. However, Kang was still very respectful of certain Western fundamentals that had links to Christian philosophy, including the idea of the constitutional monarchy, which would allow ordinary citizens to participate in the political process through some sort of democracy. Kung believed that Confucianism at its core necessitated continuing political and institutional reform in order to stop the dynasty from stagnating and eventually decaying. Kung was also a utopian in a sense, 
as he saw history as developing unilinearly from an age of chaos and disorder to an age of peace, where mankind lived as one in a great and prosperous community. Despite apparently receiving the memorial in 1895, the Guangxu Emperor did not make moves to enact any reform policies until he received a second petition from Kang in 1898, restating the policies and goals of 1895. This time, the young emperor responded enthusiastically and invited Kang to court in June of 1898, after which he launched the 100 Days Reforms. This reform movement saw the emperor issue hundreds of decrees calling for the revamping of the agriculture, commerce and industry sectors, the development of railways and post offices, a cutback in private government spending, probably aimed at Emperor Cixi's extravagances, a new training program for the military, strengthening of the navy, the establishment of primary and high schools at local levels, a university in Beijing, and the replacement of some of the old sections of the civil service exam, such as calligraphy, for new sections focused on current affairs. He also wanted to revamp the government offices and compile a completely new set of administrative regulations. Any mentions of a change in government structure or some form of constitutional monarchy were skillfully avoided. No doubt, Kang Youwei thought that over time, he could convince the young emperor, who seemed to be coming into his strength, to adopt some more radical reforms in order to bring China into the modern era. However, this impression of a long period of time in which to enact these reforms, as well as a newfound freedom on behalf of the emperor, were an illusion. The emperor still had not escaped the clutches of his aunt, Cixi, nor her powerful faction who practically ran the courts and its administration. In September of 1898, Empress Dowager Cixi and her conservative faction staged a successful coup d'etat, revoking all the policies enacted under the 100 Days Reform and capturing and killing six prominent reformers, including Kang Youwei's younger brother. Kang Youwei himself managed to flee to Hong Kong, while Liang Qichao made it to Japan. The Guangxu Emperor was put under house arrest and Cixi was now the unquestionable leader of China. The reform movement was severely crippled, however, it was still not quite dead. A glimmer of hope still remained for the reforming factions. Its leaders were not all dead, and they still had their part to play. Behind the scenes, far from the action of Beijing, but spurred on by the disastrous events that had occurred there, new leaders were also emerging, who would soon step into the spotlight, changing China's fate forever. We're now actually in the 20th century specifically the first decade of the 1900s, which saw the building of tension between several different groups, conservatives, reformers, and revolutionaries, as well as individual antagonists and anarchists. It was these growing tensions that allowed what was actually an accidental explosion to bring down a 2000 year old imperial tradition. While Kang Youwei and his cohort had been making moves in Canton and Beijing, Another young man had been making his own moves to reform and eventually revolutionise China. Sun Zhongshan, more commonly known as Sun Yat-sen, would go on to become the most famous man in China, although this was not so apparent in the 1880s and 90s. Born into a relatively poor Cantonese family, he moved to Hawaii to be educated with his brother, and after moving to Hong Kong to study medicine, quickly came to believe that what China needed was a republican revolution. He petitioned to join Li Hongjiang's cohort in the 1890s, although he never got a response, probably because Li was a bit busy dealing with the Japanese in Korea. Frustrated, Sun decided instead to try and raise money for a secret organisation that he founded, linking up with another group to try and overthrow the dynasty in a plot that failed and led to Sun fleeing and eventually settling in London. After narrowly evading a kidnapping attempt by Qing overseas officials, he continued to raise money for his cause, forming connections with important merchants such as Charlie Sung, whose children would go on to play an important role in the 20th century. The arrival of Republicans and anarchists onto the scene in the early 1900s meant that Chinese reformers were split effectively into four camps. There were those who wanted to preserve as much as possible about the current regime. These were people like Kang Youwei, who had actually developed a close personal attachment to the Guangxu Emperor, and was therefore determined to revive the Qing regime, essentially constituting a reform from above. However, as anti-Manchu sentiment grew, 
even the famous Kung, who was not actually around in China to defend his views, seemed to be out of touch with the reality of the situation, especially after the Guangxu Emperor and Empress Dowager Cixi died in 1908, and the Manchu elites put yet another child emperor, Pu Yi, on the throne. The people increasingly believed that any reforms made would not be in good faith, but rather would be made to preserve the ruling dynasty's hold on the nation. I can't say they were wrong. There were some changes made, such as the setting up of provincial assemblies, but the drive to build a new army meant that taxes increased sharply, and the Qing wasn't ever able to recover its favourable image, no matter what it did from that point onwards. Here, Kang differed from his protégé and former collaborator Liang Qichao whose views tended more towards constitutional monarchy, despite the fact that he believed the people were not yet ready for full voting rights. Instead, he used newspapers to extol his views on the need for a strong initial leadership by wise rulers who would guide the country into a bright future. The anarchists were basically terrorists, with some light Marxism sprinkled in, but as no one special from this group really comes out at the time, we can save these guys for a later episode. Sun Yat-sen had formed what's known as the Tongmon Hui, or Revolutionary Alliance, in 1905. They were the last group. It was a broad group of secret societies with varying views on the type of reforms that should take place, but they all essentially identified as nationalists who wanted to end Western, Japanese and Manchu rule in China and hold a revolution to set up a republican government. As support for Kang Yo Wei slipped, The alliance managed to attract many of his former backers, as well as many new recruits from the seemingly inevitable military takeover. By 1911, the year when the Xinhai Revolution took place and China was kick-started into a revolution, they had over 10,000 members. It's slightly ironic that the events that actually led to the downfall of the Qing directly were not actually precipitated by any of these groups. Despite all of their planning, growing, plotting, None of the revolutionary leaders could predict what would happen next, and when it did happen, it became an all-out race to try and take control of the situation. And that's what we'll be talking about in the next episode. So that's it for episode two, guys. We finally made it to the 20th century, as I promised. The next episode is going to be all about the Xinhai Revolution and the events that finally dismantled imperial rule in China for good. We're out of the summary phase now and into the real meat of the series. So the episodes are going to be a lot more detailed and possibly a little bit longer as well. I hope that's what you signed up for. And I hope you're looking forward to the next episode. I hope you tune in, guys. Thanks for listening.